Um, so I'm going to talk about the brief introduction, talk about the context, um, explain a little bit about how transition works. Um, my plans A and B, because A was the first plan that didn't work, so we went to try B. Uh, a quick look at some methods, focus on the findings, and uh, we'll know what I'm going to do next. So, uh, my context, this is a little something about my school. Um, we're a, a special school. We uh, look after learners with autism and complex needs and challenging behaviour. Um, there are 76 uh, learners in my school who uh, range from age 5 to age 19. So we go all, do what we do all the key stages and we have a, a year 14 final year. Um, so unlike most other schools. Um, so 76 kids, 220 staff, only 17 of whom are teachers. So it's a bit different to most schools. Um, we're Catholic. I don't know why I put that there. It's probably some sort of feeling of guilt. Um, but <laughs> Catholicism and autism don't always make easy bedfellows, as you can imagine. But so we're, at, we're an independent school, um, owned by the Catholic Church, but going since about 1940. Um, and uh, so we're fee paying, but of the 76 kids, I think only two are paid for by their parents because we are hugely, hugely expensive. Uh, we make you know, eat and look, look cheap. Um, so we're independent. And we're the last chance um, for most of the children at our school. If they don't make it with us, they will be going to a secure unit or a special hospital. Um, so we are kind of their last chance for education. Our intakes all across the UK. We specialise in the South of England. We've got kids from as far away as Luxembourg. Um, not surprisingly, Luxembourg, being a small country, doesn't have a lot of specialist provision for uh, children uh, like, uh, like us. So that's my school. I'm head of Key Stage 4 and head of sport. We've got only 17 teachers. We all have to multitask. Um, transition. In mainstream, I think transition is very straightforward. You sort of do your GCSEs and then you either do your A-levels or not, and then you do your A-levels and you go on to university and everything kind of hunky-dory. Um, in special needs, transition is uh, quite different because it's the local authorities have involved, social workers, um, and it's, there's quite, it's quite a, a structured um, uh, move through education. Um, uh, which is governed by what's called the NCN Toolkit, um, which is the, the, uh, the, the book of words that tell us how um, this works through. It's all changing, of course. Um, there's two acts uh, which are now, um, now law, and from September 2014, um, there's a whole new way of transitioning through, um, which is designed to combine uh, care, education, and health together in a concerted way which has signally failed to happen um, up to this point with quite a lot of initiatives. Hopefully it will work. But year nine um, is the transition point from key stage three to key stage four. And then you move from to year 11, uh, age 16, um, where they then transition on, and then it's year 14. Um, and what I wanted to look at with my research was the the transition through the school and how it worked, but particularly moving from year 14 um, into post-19 provision. Uh, very few, uh, well none of our the uh, learners in, in my school will go on to a conventional um, outcome. Most of them will go on to uh, a social care setting, residential further education, um, and that sort of situation. And some of them will go nowhere, and some of them will just end up at home, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, that's the SEN code of practice, the SEN toolkit, which I just mentioned. The connection service used to be a very valuable component in the transition uh, process, um, but the, sadly it's been wrapped up by the government. The connection service was um, an organisation which was independent of the school, which provided advice on where children should go next. Um, it was wrapped up, uh, no doubt to save money, um, and the onus was then put back onto schools to provide this advice. Um, schools, of course, not necessarily the best people to, um, you know, to do it. We don't have a structure to do that sort of thing, but um, the onus is back on us and local authorities to do that, and it's very mixed uh, results in the moment. 
Um, the a couple of things that really sparked um, uh, my, um, my interest in this particular field was this quote here. It's common for the decision on a young person's new placement to remain undecided until the very end of their last school year, and in some cases after they had finished and left school. Um, and that's a quote from the um, uh, all-party parliamentary group on autism in 2009. So you've got kids in their last year at school, they're coming up you know, right, right now, and they don't know where they're going next, which is appalling, particularly for children with autism. And also said, for those leaving care, boarding or residential college, future independent adult life is a daunting unknown. And so that's the sort of <coughs> context I was thinking of. And I wanted to find out more about what was happening as children moved through my school and moved on into that into post 19. So, what was plan A? Well, plan A, qualitative case study, seems like a good idea. Um, interview the leavers. Um, there were some technical issues about that, interviewing people who can't speak, uh, don't want to speak, uh, who've got physical challenges and so on. It's difficult, but doable. There's plenty of evidence to show that it's a doable proposition to actually conduct meaningful interviews with people who've got challenging disabilities. So that wasn't a problem. The real problem I ran into was the issue of consent. Now, when children are at school at below the age of 18, their parents can give approval for them. As soon as they've left school and they are they're moving, particularly when they're moving into uh, residential further education or they are in um, NHS managed settings, the whole issue of consent becomes an absolute minefield. It's possible to do it, but when you're doing an MA part-time, you're teaching full-time, it really wasn't a, a proposition that I could, um, you know, that I could entertain. It was just it would have taken years, and um, I don't think much use of it. I think we'd have both retired before I'd finished. So, plan B. And plan B, qualitative case study, but this time interview parents and carers, who, at the end of the day, I was going to, I wanted to interview anyway, but, um, my focus is going to turn to them and their um, opinions and uh, their experiences. Um, so that's what I did. Uh, it's, uh, it's a case study as endorsed by Messrs. Stake and Yin. Um, and I did a literature review as well. So let's have a quick look, summary of the literature review. Organisational transition was poor. So I've looked at the, um, spread the literature into two chunks. One was um, about the actual transition process, and the other was the parental experience. Um, the the, the, uh, the organisation of transition, there's been a fair amount of research on it. There's, um, there's a, big, uh, a big piece of research um, which is culminated in what's called Wave 3, uh, interviewing 1,800 uh, young people. And the overall upshot of that was that the organisation of the transition process was really quite weak. Um, and that's endorsed by all the other papers. Second thing, while I was looking at the parental experience, most experience, parents experience very high levels of stress. And those are the two main findings there. So what did I do? Semi-structured interviews. I took a, a, a linear approach to, uh, to my interviews, and I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a minute. Did the first interview as a pilot, and I sort of, you know, adjusted after that. Um, recorded them all, transcribed them, coded, and did a thematic approach. So looking for common themes in the, uh, in the interviews. These are the people that I interviewed, um, and there's, there's some interesting bits actually that come out of this. Um, so you've got who the uh, young person was, as you can see, they're all in their early twenties. So they've left school for two, three years. Where they are now, um, lots of them are in um, residential training establishments, resident FE. There's, uh, this guy's living at home, um, he's, he's a neat, um, but lots of them actually in FE or residential placements. Family circumstances, very interesting here. Lots and lots of family difficulties. There was only one mother and father unit complete and without any sort of issues. I mean, we've got here, this one here, father businessman, avoidant of caring role, mother at home, and a recovering alcoholic. Um, this guy, uh, guy here, 
father's a petrochemical engineer working <coughs> abroad. My mother suffers from depression. Parents separated, fostered. Um, this guy's father was a professional football, ex-professional footballer. Um, and I think there were issues of bullying in the family. He wasn't a very nice man. Um, separated parents um, and foster mother. So lots of uh, uh, family difficulties there. Lots of them caused by having a child with complex needs, challenging behaviour. So what did I find out after the interviews? Interesting thing after I did my interviews, two of the interviewees followed up. One of them wrote me a 4,000 word report on what happened next for their child, uh, which is uh, you know, rather took me by surprise. Um, and the, um, uh, the, other, the other thing that happened was another one of them uh, sent you regular email reports on how they were getting on with the dreadful Surrey local authority who were really stitching them up big time. Um, so as it was quite interesting because of course as a researcher you have to kind of maintain some kind of distance um, and, but when you get involved with um, families like this and you're there for a couple of hours and you're, you know, they're pouring out their life story to you it's very difficult to go away and, and not do anything else and, and so sure enough they, you know, they often follow up with um, contact which is something you're careful of. Um, so findings, two sets of findings the facts. Um, and this goes back to the linear approach that I took to uh, my interviews. In order to sort of get to the, the nitty gritty, you sort of start off with how did you get your child into our school? What was it like getting them into school? How did, did they make progress? Why did you choose the school? Things like sort of like soft questions and, and it gives it the, gave the interviews a sense of logic. You start off at the beginning and you move towards the end. So I came up with a lot of factual answers, things like, we like the school because it looked like Hogwarts. We like the school because it is, it's a rambly old pile. Um, we like the, uh, the fact that um, uh, speech and language therapy is all in-house and not like by the NHS. We like the 23 acres of greenery all around the you know, uh, uh, school. We like the head teacher, who at the time was a charming man uh, called Bob and very charismatic. So those sort of factual sort of things. Uh, which were interesting, um, but then there was the, uh, well, there they are, uh, but the second was the sort of the main interpretive theme, so that's moving away from the facts onto this sort of the nitty gritty of how you felt about it. And there was really four main themes um, that came out, which and they were really quite striking. One was the importance of relationships, relationships with family, relationships with friends, relationships with other people. Um, in, the, in particular, what you found, I find, was that Families tended to be uh, have, have find um, individuals that they came across who were really, really helpful, and they, they all sort of had, you know, it might be a paediatrician who had been really, you know, uh, crucial to um, getting their child diagnosed. Um, it could have been um, a care worker, a social worker who had really gone, gone beyond the call of duty, and they all seemed to find these people. Um, stress and isolation. Most of the families had real problems um, with stress and being isolated. Um, you know, looking after these kids can be very, very difficult, um, and it doesn't stop getting difficult as they go through life. And most of the families realise this, that it's, um, because autism is not something that you can cure, you can just manage it, you know, that's, and that's all you can do. But for people with uh, challenging behaviour, that challenge behaviour doesn't often go away. Um, and you can have it, you know, well into the future. Uh, disappointment and frustration. Big problems with um, bureaucracy um, overall, um, particularly with the uh, way local authorities and the way local authorities manage transition. Because of the cuts in um, spending since 2005, 2006, uh, the resources that have gone into the transition process have produced, which means that instead of having a social worker appointed that stays with you through the process, you end up as a parent, you go to a meeting and it's the duty social worker who comes along, the duty social worker who knows nothing about your child, its circumstances, its education and so on, and has to relearn everything every time. And this is a common, this was a, 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 
a continuing th theme through all the interviews. They had problems with social workers changing, local authorities changing policies, um, and, um, uh, and money being a, a real, real issue. Um, but it's not all bad. Um, there were positives. Uh, lots of, um, you know, there were lots of good stories, positive stories um, about how their children or how they saw their children changing and growing up um, and their aspirations for them. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's, and there's, there's the, when I did my literature review, there's some really interesting papers about how families will see the best in children um, despite all the evidence you may, that might be there to the contrary, that these kids are you know, really difficult and they're violent and they use fecal smearing and all the rest of it, but mum and dad still are there and love them and, you know, and uh, very supportive. So, um, yeah, so there were positives as well. What's next? Well, the logical sort of thing to do here is, I mean, when I did my research, I saw that it was like a little snapshot in time. I saw I was looking at a group of people who had already left. So the logical thing to do, of course, is, um, oh, well, that was a particular thing. Yeah, one of the things I came across uh, was how do you measure parental stress? And in fact, there is something called the Stress Index for Parenting Adolescents. Um, so I thought I might use that at some point in the future. But, uh, big idea that I want to do is to do a longitudinal study. So instead of just taking a snapshot of kids at uh, a point in time, to start off at year nine and follow them all the way through um, over you know, five, six, seven years um, and, see, um, and see what the changes are over time. So that's what I plan to do next. Yeah, follow them through. Oh yeah, include some children this time. I'm going to have to probably go take early retirement or uh, go part time in order to, uh, you know, to do that. Uh, some uh, bits and bobs there. And there you are. Any questions?